So yeah, uh, dear participants and uh, all of you who will be watching this uh, event, uh, greetings. This is Somava Basu, President and Founder of the Council for Global Cooperation, CGC. And I would like to warmly welcome you all to our today's uh, session. Our today's session, we are again back with another important book. Uh, today we focus on a new book by Omar Bartov, Genocide, the Holocaust in Israel-Palestine, First Person History in Times of Crisis. Genocide, the Holocaust in Israel-Palestine was published in August 2023 by Bloomsbury Publishing. This book is an important work presenting the history of Israel-Palestine and the first person narrative and stories to Holocaust and genocide. Before we start our event today, it is important to note when discussing this book today, we are aware that the world is witnessing a devastating war in the Middle East, uh, which began uh, on October 7, 2023. As the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza surpassed 100 days, what has been achieved is nothing other than devastation. In times like this, when emotions run high and headlines are dominated by the events unfolding in the region, it becomes even more imperative for us to come together and engage in meaningful discussions. While the book today does not directly address the events of and post October 7, uh, it addresses some deep intricacies of the Israel-Palestine history of conflict and violence that resonate to modern day. Our purpose today is to is not to take sides on right and uh, wrong, uh, but to illuminate the path of understanding the underlying historical causes of this conflict, war and violence. The objective of today's discussion is not to propose a solution, but solely to engage in, a, in an academic discourse. I recall Professor Omar Bartov's words in the recent article for CGC, where he emphasized that only a political stalemate could stop this war, a sentiment that holds true. Furthermore, we believe that only through healthy academic discourse, we can pave the way for peace and justice. Uh, the CGC deeply mourns the countless lives affected by this war and advocates for peace, justice, and freedom for all, irrespective of their religion, country, and citizenship. So our featured speaker this evening is none other than uh, Professor Omar Bato, Samuel Pisser, Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University and the co-chair of Genocide, Holocaust, and Disaster Studies Vertex within the CGC. As for Professor uh, Bartov, I, I'm sure everyone in our forum is well acquainted with him by now. He doesn't uh, require a formal introduction. We are all, you know, mesmerized by his energy as this is the third book written by him within 2022 to 23. And uh, this is the third time he's appearing in one of our events. So at the same time, we are really deeply proud of his works and initiatives that he has been doing to uh, and encouraging us as well to uh, bring in light to the sufferings and uh, uh, the aspects of uh, war every day, advocating for justice and peace. So, uh, what I have always admired about Professor Bartov's scholarships, uh, whether it is on the history of Holocaust, borderlands, or Eastern Europe, is his balanced and clear presentation of facts and documentation of history in a secular and most objective way. And for readers, these are the qualities we can find while reading his monograph on Israel-Palestine as well. And this is what makes genocide, the Holocaust in Israel-Palestine a must read for all scholars who wish to understand Israel-Palestine history. It is a great privilege and honor to welcome you back in our book discussion, Professor Bartov, to welcome and discuss your new book along with our other distinguished panelists, Professors Jan Ross, Benny Morris, and Amal Jamal, who, whom I would introduce a little later during the discussion. So with a, without further delays, I would now like to pass on the floor to Professor Omar Bhatta for his opening remarks. And Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sumava. And, and thank you, first of all, uh, for organizing this. And I'm, I'm really very um, grateful that we managed to do it. We had some difficulties because uh, 
um, although this was the least of the prices to be paid uh, because of the events of October 7th and everything that followed. Uh, but I'm glad that we managed to uh, get the panel together and I'm very grateful to the panelists for joining us and everyone else and I'm especially looking forward to hearing their remarks. So I'll try to uh, be quite brief um, and speak only a few minutes. Um, I'd, I'd like to say first that um, um, we are indeed in a very uh, difficult time right now uh, in the region. Um, a time of great chaos and confusion and violence. Uh, and I think all of us uh, have that uh, constantly in the back of our minds. Uh, this book obviously came out just before all of this happened, but I would want to emphasize that uh, both the book and some activities that occurred just before the war, and particularly a petition that uh, several colleagues and I had issued in August, the same month that the book came out, uh, had pointed out, uh, our opinion at least, the, the elephant in the room in everything that was happening in Israel at the time was the occupation. And that occupation uh, of millions of Palestinians uh, in different ways, uh, in, in the West Bank, uh, in Gaza, and also the uh, treatment of Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, um, was the, the context uh, for everything that uh, blew up in everyone's face uh, on October 7th and everything that follows. Um, so the book does not obviously refer directly to these events because it was written before, uh, but I think it does provide some kind of way of thinking about it. Um, um, so that's the first comment I wanted to make. Uh, I, I do want to say in passing because this morning, the International Court of Justice uh, uh, decided on provisional measures, recommended uh, but binding provisional measures. Um, um, and whatever those are, and this is not the time to discuss them uh, unless there are questions about it later on, um, they are based on its finding that there is plausibility uh, to the arguments by South Africa uh, that Israel is in breach of the um, 1948 uh, Convention on Genocide. Uh, and that's a very, ultimately very sad moment. It's being reported now in Israel as um, not so, not such a big deal because it doesn't uh, call for a ceasefire. But the very fact that this has happened and that the ICJ has found some plausibility is uh, very troubling, and I think will also have uh, repercussions uh, down the line. So about the book itself, um, I want to say first, the, the title of the book it was not my original title, but the uh, recommendation by one of the readers and uh, the publisher, and I thought, well, it's a kind of inane title. It's uh, not a very elegant title. Uh, and then when the book came out, uh, some of the attention it got was precisely because of the title. So I was totally wrong on that. <laughs> and the reason is, of course, that the title combines uh, genocide, the Holocaust, and Israel-Palestine. And those are two or three um, um, designations that one does not always want to put together. Um, and th the reason it's called that is because it deals with these uh, three issues and also tries to find all kind of connections between them. And, f and the subtitle of the, of the book, of, um, um, uh, First Person History in Times of Crisis, is really, I would say, the leitmotif that I'm interested in within that uh, combination of relations between the, the general phenomenon of genocide, the specific case of the Holocaust, and uh, the case of Israel-Palestine. So the book is uh, divided into several parts. Um, and, and I should add that this book, some of the chapters in this book were published before as um, uh, journal articles or book chapters. Uh, some uh, are made of uh, unpublished papers, 
uh, and some are a combination of various writings, some published and some not, uh, but all of them have been uh, updated and connected to each other in ways that I hadn't quite thought until I started working on this book, how in some ways this book reflects uh, my own work and interest over the past 15 years or so. Um, and I think the way it's organized also uh, is consistent with that evolution. So the the first part, um, what I call writing atrocity, uh, deals first of all with the, a long-standing debate that is not over on the relationship between the phenomenon of genocide as such and the Holocaust specifically. We may talk much more about it. This is not at all about Israel-Palestine, uh, although uh, this issue has been raised also within that context. That is, uh, the debate between genocide as a generic phenomenon, especially modern genocide, and what has been called the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of um, um, this terminology, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, but obviously, like all genocides, as I argue, the Holocaust also had several unique features, and, and those are important to uh, stress, uh, but it's just as important to see its, its relationship to other cases of genocide. Um, um, and that's what we, as historians, I think, uh, um, need to do. Uh, another element in this uh, part of the book is uh, um, um, trying to locate specifically the case of the Holocaust within the geographical area and the historiographical context within which it happened, which was largely in Eastern Europe. Um, now, this is a shift that has been happening over the last 20 years or so of, uh, if you like, relocating uh, the Holocaust specifically from the center uh, of decision making and for, from the process of decision making to uh, events on the ground. And that's where also this question of first person history comes in, because there is a difference between writing uh, the history of the Holocaust from the top or from the center, from Berlin, and from the uh, aspect of where it actually happens, from the perspective of its occurrence. And of course, uh, in much of this, I was um, guided and, and, and instructed uh, by Jan Gross, who is sitting with us now, and his uh, path-breaking book, uh, Neighbors, uh, which uh, showed not only the importance of uh, doing this kind of work of seeing what happened on the ground, but also how anything but marginal doing that is. Uh, that is that if you do that, it has all kinds of repercussions, uh, both historiographical and political. Uh, and, and it did indeed have those uh, in Poland. And I think by extension, generally, uh, in uh, speaking about um, the Holocaust specifically, but also I think about other genocides. Uh, the second part is really uh, focuses on um, the issue that, that Jan Gross uh, dealt with and that then I uh, picked up uh, over the last, uh, this was, I started that about 25 years ago already, so it's not so recent, the research itself, but that ended up with the book Anatomy of a Genocide, that is uh, writing the, the history of the Holocaust and of genocide as a local history and seeing what are the benefits of doing so. What do you see from below that you don't see from above? Uh, and how does that impact our understanding of the event, um, um, our understanding of the use, uh, among other things, of first-person history, or, or if you like, in this case, of individual uh, testimonies or individual voices uh, from wherever we can find that. And I make the case there uh, for the use of uh, such um, testimonies as documents, as historical documents, obviously contextualized within a larger uh, attempt to uh, locate all uh, documentation. Uh, moving quickly to the third part, and that has some uh, relevance today because of what I just said now uh, on the events in the ICJ. 
is the question of uh, justice and denial. Uh, and, and I look at that uh, through uh, two prisms. <clears throat> One is specifically uh, about how particular perpetrators of the Holocaust, in this case, people who were involved in the town that I researched, uh, were uh, brought to justice and what sort of arguments came up. Uh, what do you learn from uh, delving into uh, these kinds of uh, judicial proceedings, many of which uh, used um, first-person accounts. In fact, they started using them before uh, historians decided that maybe they should look at them. Uh, and um, in that sense, uh, courts in Germany and from the late 50s into the 60s and 70s uh, based much of what they did uh, on the collection of evidence from uh, people on the ground, both perpetrators, and this is low-ranking local perpetrators, uh, bystanders, so to speak, um, and victims or survivors in this case, of course. Uh, so I look into the logic of that, and in the second uh, part, um, uh, or in the second chapter of this part, uh, I talk more generally about uh, what I call here memory laws as tools of forgetting. Um, and I'm interested in a triangular relationship here between uh, memory laws in Ukraine, Poland, and Israel, and how they are uh, each looking uh, over their shoulder at the other two, uh, and how by insisting on remembering certain aspects of a dark or troubled uh, past, uh, they are um, simultaneously engaged in um, obfuscating um, or hiding uh, certain aspects of their own past. Uh, and so the, the exposure of one kind of past and legislating its memory uh, often has to do also with covering up or uh, denying the need or actually criminalizing in some cases um, engagement with another past, uh, with a past uh, in, in which in the light of which you would not want your own nation to be seen. Um, the, I, in, the, in, in the last two parts, and I, I'll be very brief now, um, the, the fourth part, uh, I deal specifically with, with first-person histories. Uh, and I deal with that both uh, in terms of the area that I've been working on. This uh, refers in part to uh, my previous book, Tales from the Borderlands, uh, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past. Um, and I talk about individuals who uh, left uh, this, this borderland area uh, and what became of them. Um, how um, people who had come from the margins uh, had become uh, major actors in both writing the history of uh, that borderlands and in trying to change the world uh, that they had mm -hmm. moved into. Uh, and I use a number of uh, interesting characters to talk about the importance of understanding that area of the borderlands through the stories that people who came out of it had told about it. Um, it and in the last part, which is the most relevant to uh, what uh, uh, Sumava was saying and to the current situation, I talk about a number of issues that have to do with Israel-Palestine, and I want to say um, that I'm right now engaged in writing a book that I speak about, or that I'm trying to think through in some of these last three chapters, and that's a book that is actually based on um, scores of interviews that I conducted in Israel uh, in the, in late 2022 just before everything sort of fell apart, uh, with uh, both uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel, uh, one of whom is among us. Uh, Amal Jamal was one of the people that I spoke with at length, uh, uh, among about 75 people that um, I interviewed for this book. Uh, and so what I, what I do in this uh, last part is, first of all, there is a chapter um, that to me is important in many ways uh, regarding the current situation, which has to do with displacement. Uh, the main 
argument here <clears throat> is that um, displacement is an experience that um, binds in many ways uh, the Jewish and the Palestinian um, uh, Jewish and Palestinian faith. Uh, that is that uh, uh, large numbers of Jews who came to Palestine, uh, certainly after 1945, came as displaced populations. Uh, those displaced populations that had undergone um, um, and other forms of violence uh, as they were coming into Palestine were part of a general um, historical move whereby by the end of 1948, the majority of the Palestinians uh, who were living in what became the state of Israel uh, were also displaced, uh, whether they uh, were uh, directly expelled uh, or they fled. Um, most of them, the vast majority, were gone and were not allowed back. Uh, and so I talk about both the personal connection, the historiographical connection. I don't make comparisons between the Holocaust and the Nakba. That's not the point, but I talk about them as related processes, uh, both historically, historiographically, and on a personal level. Uh, and the last part I won't talk about and everything here, but the, the very last chapter is really my attempt to think at how can we um, write about this period and how can we, through listening to accounts by uh, members of a particular generation, and that is uh, my generation, the generation of a number of people here, not all, certainly not Sumava, but those who were born uh, between uh, the late 1940s and the early 1960s, uh, who are the first generation uh, in Israel, the first generation of the state, uh, both Jews and Palestinians, how if we listen to them talk uh, about their own um, making and their own connection to the place, how they feel they are connected to it, uh, if we listen to their family history, uh, most of members of that generation have a traumatic family history, uh, direct, that is parental or from, through their grandparents. They're associated with displacement, with trauma, with genocide, and so forth. Uh, if we listen to them talk, uh, we reach a different understanding of um, both the history of that place the relationship between uh, people in that place and the powerful link that people have to it uh, in a way that is political, but is also uh, deeper than politics. That is, uh, if we listen empathetically to those histories, then those personal histories, then we gain um, some kind of, uh, as I argue, we, we're making a first step to some kind of reconciliation between groups with associated, connected experiences that in the political discourse are usually uh, shown as being in competition with each other or in struggle with, with each other. And that those can be seen rather as a first step toward uh, mutual understanding and reconciliation. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to everybody's comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for providing a wonderful overview of your book and highlights from your stimulating research. And you have indeed opened a lot for us to you know, discuss and uh, take it forward. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to inform uh, to our participants that in, in the Zoom room, that followed by the uh, commentary session and Professor Bertov's response, we will, we will be having a short a discussion plus Q&A session together. So uh, the participants can write their questions in the chat box or use the hand hands hands up function to ask questions. So with this, uh, let us now go to our dis distinguished panelists in our today's session for their commentary. And I would like to start with our first panelist, uh, Professor Jan Gross. Professor Jan Gross is the Professor of History Emeritus at Princeton University. He's a scholar of modern Europe and Polish history, focusing on the study of comparative politics 
and uh, Eastern European politics and the Holocaust. Professor Gross is the author of several books on Polish history, particularly Polish-Jewish relations during World War II and the Holocaust, namely uh, Revolution from Abroad, the Soviet Conquest of Poland's Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia, Fear Anti-Semitism in Poland after Auschwitz, and most important, uh, Neighbors, the Destruction of the Jewish Community in Jedwabna, Poland. It is a great privilege to finally meet you, Professor Gross. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sumala. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Omer, for the invitation to, <clears throat> to be part of, uh, of the discussion. I'll, I'll be very brief. We want to listen to you and to your uh, comments on the variety of issues that has been raised by your book. Uh, at the risk of embarrassing you publicly, I want to say without equivocation that it's truly a wonderful piece of writing and, uh, and a very difficult one, in fact, to, uh, to be uh, of that quality, given that putting together essays written over uh, 10 years or more and just ending up with a very intellectually sort of consistent, exciting, complementary, uh, and very beautifully written uh, piece of work uh, is, uh, is, is an amazing achievement. And, uh, and of course, it came out at, a, at an auspicious moment, just before uh, this last uh, horrendous catastrophe that has, is being played out uh, in uh, 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 Israel Palestine as, as as we speak so to speak and I'll I'll be uh, I don't have any interesting observations to to add and contribute on the Israel Palestine aspect uh, of uh, uh, and uh, sort of uh, context uh, of your writings I've I've I have a study the subject I haven't lived, I don't have the experiential, so to speak, the wisdom that comes from, from living in the area over extended periods of time, just beyond a few, a few quick trips to do research. Uh, so let me, let me just very briefly um, say a few things about the Holocaust part of your uh, inquiry uh, there. Um, what I found very, very uh, appealing and very uh, touching, in a way, um, and, and and also very interesting. I mean, this is the this uh, first person history um, theme uh, that's so pronounced in the book, uh, in in a variety of ways. First of all, in the style of writing and in the uh, in a kind of. Uh, profound, it seems to me, a statement that's made by the content of the book, namely that a historian ought to uh, not be afraid to present a deeply researched and reflected upon uh, uh, work in first-person narrative. This is one of the uh, aspects, it seems to me, of the first uh, first-person history that you write about, but also a complementary first-person history, namely uh, that sort of valuation of personal testimonies as uh, indispensable material on the basis of which one writes, particularly uh, about periods which uh, where this tremendous social upheaval uh, uh, is uh, um, which are characterized by this tremendous social upheaval. This is a time when sort of institutional sources producing documentation are particularly inadequate to to render and give us a sense of uh, of what's really going on. This is these are aspects that are extremely dear to my frame of mind and my thinking, uh, and and I hope also. Um, written practice as I as I do history. But I was struck, I must say, when, when reading uh, um, your book, but as, by, by, by a certain parallel in, uh, if I may be uh, first person here, in our intellectual developments here, in, the, in a certain trajectory which we had 
uh, in coming to uh, address the problematic of uh, Holocaust, which became for you and for me as well, a, a kind of main preoccupation and uh, focus of uh, uh, extraordinarily deep interest. And uh, what I mean by this is the sort of a fairly long period of gestation. It takes a long time for you. It takes a long time for, for me as well, if I may say, to kind of realize how, what an important subject it is. And uh, I was especially curious, uh, and, and I hope maybe you will have an insight into it because I, I really don't understand it. Uh, when uh, when thinking about my own uh, intellectual development, uh, um, I'm I'm older uh, than you by I checked it or seven years. That's not very much, but quite a bit at the same time. Uh, and uh, I thought about uh, the, the teenage and, and well, in fact, late teenage years. Uh, in uh, in Poland, in a milieu that must have been in many ways similar to yours in Israel, of very politically and intellectually engaged uh, young people. In 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 my case, I would say we were the 68ers. This is probably not a good designation yet for you, uh, uh, because 60 you were you were you were in high school when when uh, when 68 comes about. Uh, but uh, but actually, we our milieu in Poland we uh, we were uh, we were in high school and we had this period of extraordinarily intense debate about the world in general, about politics, about history, about things that have been hidden from us by our um, parents or elders generation by sort of. Uh, uh, obfuscation and censorship that the communist in Poland we this was the period of the communist rule so uh, kind of looking behind every stone so to speak to see what what real history there is and what really has happened that we haven't been told because of the censorship and one thing which I realize uh, was completely missing from our discussion. And if I say I, our, I mean, uh, this was this was a group of uh, young people who are mostly children of survivors, as it were, Jewish background, mostly, uh, and uh, um, leftist. Most of the parents were either had their biographies that went through. Uh, um, uh, with communist party membership and so forth. Many, many of the parents who survived deep in the Soviet Union, sort of exiled there or, or uh, taken refuge, but many uh, whose, whose parents uh, um, lived in Poland and were survivors in the very literal sense. And we never, never got interested in the Holocaust. There was never a conversation, as far as I can tell, with my friends, uh, within our milieu, or even, if, I, again, I, I just, uh, this is a very personal uh, recollection. I had a very open and, and uh, kind of free-flowing relationship with my parents. Conversations about the war abounded. Uh, you know, my father uh, had to, hide all, all the time, so to speak, uh, because not, not only was he Jewish, but he also looked Jewish very much, uh, even though he came from a deeply assimilated background and somehow moved in, uh, in, in, in those medias. In, in my mother's case, again, I mean, her first husband was also was a, was a Jew, an assimilated Jew. He got killed because he was denounced. So this dimension of the Holocaust, in a way, was surrounding it. No interest, no curiosity, no conversation about it. And then I read in your book uh, that you have this sort of 
epiphany, so to speak, a conversation with a, with a reservist, a fellow reservist who is older than you, Romanian, uh, who happened to be a, a child survivor from Romania in 1978 of all, in which you wonder, you, you're not interested in the Holocaust. You're interested in the war. You're in the process of writing your doctoral dissertation about the German army. And, and suddenly, and the guy kinds of puts you against this problematic and you say, hmm, really? Yeah, maybe there are a few people that I know that are interested in the Holocaust. But I certainly... I certainly did not want to make a career out of the Holocaust. This is your little. I wonder, how do you explain this? Do you have any insight that would uh, help me make sense of our own, first of all, complete disinterest in the subject? And, uh, and maybe your own too. I mean, <laughs> these were not so different. Uh, countries from the point of view of sort of saturation with the Holocaust. Israel, by definition, uh, people, uh, uh, this large numbers of survivors. But Poland, this is the place where, uh, where the whole drama played out primarily. And uh, also a lot, a lot in, in my, my case, uh, in, in the case of this milieu of, of Holocaust survivors. And then also the 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 story which uh, uh, which characterizes the development of the historical field, uh, as you put it, you know, in 1980s German history and the history of the Holocaust were largely seen as separate fields. So you read a lot, a lot, just as I did, a lot of books about the war, and in fact, hardly ever was there a mention about how how was it possible. Why, why is there such a decalage? And in our own intellectual development, this sort of blocking, and uh, I know what triggered my interest. I think I do. I mean, there was, there was a sense, a growing sense, as I uh, um, spent time immersed in literature about, about the war. And then in writing about the, a book about the war, my dissertation was also just like yours on the period of war uh, and uh, Polish society under the German occupation, one page about Jews. I'm not ashamed of what I have written in, in this one page, but it's absolutely shameful that there isn't more there. And it's very, when come to think of it, it's very uh, interesting and worthy of explanation. I don't have one coming in handily, is that this this was a very good university, Yale. I was advised by very distinguished scholars, none of them experts, of course, on uh, I was in sociology on uh, on on the on the Holocaust, so to speak, or on the war. But nevertheless, none of them found it uh, obvious that one cannot write a book about Polish society under German occupation without mentioning the Jews, that this is complete nonsense, as we would all be uh, deeply convinced about it today. So uh, this is my uh, question to you, if I may. Can, we, can you kindly uh, explain that path and, and blockage on the way to coming uh, 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 grips with, with Holocaust problematics. And uh, I don't want to take any more time, but just one brief question. It's a counterfactual question and feel free to disregard it completely. But you, you are so deeply uh, enmeshed and fond and fascinated by Buchacz for good reasons, obviously, uh, family roots but also your uh, exquisite literary um, taste and needs. I mean, Agnon comes from there, it all circulates around him. But I surmise that even if there were no Agnon from Buchacz, you, you would have been fascinated with Buchacz. And in fact, and just drawn out this kind of spiritual richness that suddenly manifests itself when this shtetl uh, breaks out of the confines of traditional communal life 
with the advent of modernity. But Puchach is not unique. There have been hundreds of such titles. And uh, obviously, a similar phenomenon must have uh, characterized places such as Koromea, Stanisław, uh, God knows what, you know, not to speak of Lviv and other places. My question is, I don't know whether you ever thought about it. I, maybe you did. It, had there not been Hitler, if there hadn't been a Holocaust, even if there was a war, the consequences of it would not have been so devastating for the, for the East European Jewry. What, what would the world look like, so to speak, if there had been? The Holocaust. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gross, for an excellent and uh, and meritorious remarks. And uh, I'm sure Professor Barto would be uh, answering to this uh, at, at, during his response. And uh, so for now, we would uh, like to uh, go to our uh, second panelists. Uh, second panelist, uh, Professor Benny Morris. Uh, Professor Benny Morris is the Emeritus Professor of History at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. As a scholar of Middle Eastern studies, Professor Morris's research focuses on the 20th century history of the Arab Israeli con conflict, Israeli Palestinian conflict, Zionism, and genocide. He has written extensively on these issues and is the author of numerous books on these subjects from which I would just name a few. One State, Two States, 1948, A History of the First Arab-Israeli War, and 1948 and After. It's a great honor to have you with us, Professor Morris, and uh, over to you, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Sumano. Um, well, I, I'll relate to um, a word which was used by um, uh, Omer, um, which was connections, and that's really what uh, this book deals with. Um, there's a problem between the word using the word connections and the word comparison, and I was somehow put off by the collect connection between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Israeli-Arab conflict and a uh, talk about a. Uh, discussion of a uh, genocide and the Holocaust, uh, because they're not really comparable, though there are strong connections between the two. Um, obviously, um, uh, the state of Israel uh, was in some way generated or fueled or connected its creation uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, the Holocaust gave uh, enormous, provided in the end, enormous um, uh, um, impetus to the international community's decision to uh, create or help create the state of Israel. That's without uh, any connection, without any uh, doubt. Um, in 48, uh, I think this is mentioned in, in uh, Bartov's book, in the 1948 war, which was um, launched by the Arabs of Palestine and sub subsequently by the surrounding Arab states, um, the Jews in Palestine, Israel, um, feared, were motivated by and feared uh, greatly that the Arabs were uh, attempting to um, uh, cause a second Holocaust. Uh, in other words, the destruction of the 650,000 Jews who lived in Palestine, Israel in 1948. And this, of course, uh, increased their motivation to fight, their uh, courage, if you like, their own families would be behind them, but also three years before many of their relatives had perished in Europe uh, at Nazi hands, in the hands of Nazi collaborators. Um, another connection, which I don't think actually Omer referred to, was that, um, <clears throat> and I'm now, I've just completed a book about war crimes in 1948 by Arabs and Jews. That's the what the book deals with. And um, not surprisingly, of course, I found that um, Holocaust survivors in the Israeli army um, uh, were prominent uh, when it came to uh, committing war crimes against Arabs. Um, you find disproportionate number of 
the criminals uh, from among uh, Holocaust survivors, um, um, which is interesting. So that's a, another connection, of course. A third connection, of course, is, um, a, and that's already to do with the conflict, um, not so much with 48, but subsequently, and that is, of course, a, the Hamas Charter, um, a, which basically preaches uh, the destruction of Israel and killing Jews behind every stone and tree. Uh, you can call that a genocidal outlook uh, approach to the problem of the conflict, not political, but genocidal. Um, and um, um, October 7th, of course, brought this home that this was, is, was, remains the intention of uh, uh, the Hamas, the destruction of Israel and the destruction of the Jews in Israel. Um, um, so there is a connection between the words genocide and the conflict in the sense of the intentionality of at least part of the Palestinian people, that part which, of course, won the elections among Palestinians in 2005, uh, 2006, sorry, and um, uh, that part which today enjoys the support of most, by all opinion, according to all opinion polls, of most Palestinians, both in Gaza and the West Bank, the Hamas, for various reasons, um, uh, which is uh, very disturbing that, that that's, um, 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 those are the plain facts. I was struck um, uh, by another connection, and that was the one made by um, uh, Omer uh, explicitly in the book. Um, when uh, during the first Intifada, I think we're talking about 1988, when the first Arab revolt against Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, um, um, uh, Itzhak Rabin, Israel's then uh, defense minister, um, said that the Israeli soldiers should break the bones, that was the phrase he used, of the Arabs who were throwing stones and whatever, Molotov cocktails, at Israeli troops and Israeli settlers. Um, and um, Omer um, tells us that he was motivated by that to send a letter to Rabin saying that um, he was a scholar of the Wehrmacht and its connection, the barbarism barbarization of the German army in World War II, and he feared that a similar barbarization or brutalization of the IDF of the Israeli army was occurring in 1988 in Israel's response to the Palestinian uprising, the first intifada. And Rabin answered him um, uh, nicely, and he probably has preserved this um, um, autographed um, um, postcard by Rabin, in which Rabin says to him, how dare you compare the IDF to the Wehrmacht. And I think this is actually quite correct. I think Rabin was right. Uh, breaking bones and killing a thousand Arabs, if that was the number, in the first intifada over a five-year period of rebellion, even though it wasn't a particularly lethal rebellion as compared, say, to the second intifada, um, doesn't really bear a comparison to the behavior of the Wehrmacht as outlined by Omer Bartov in his path-breaking book on the German army in World War II in the East. Um, um, and and th this, is, this is a problem. It's a problematic, uh, in my view, and underlies in some way much of the book, book's argument and descriptions. <clears throat> um, some things cannot simply be compared beating up Arabs, breaking bones, killing a thousand Arabs in a revolt, however brutal, has no comparison, bears no comparison to killing six million people or a large chunk of them by the German Wehrmacht, obviously. Um, a second thing which uh, I was uh, um, struck by, and in some parts, um, Omer was certainly correct in that, uh, is the erasure, the, the attempt to erase the other side from cognition, from books, from the educational system, etc., Israel and the Palestinian Nakba. In other words, what Israel had done to the Palestinians in 48, which is something I wrote things about. Um, and in the 50s and 60s, uh, quite correctly, uh, Omer uh, says, was totally uh, um, cast aside, ignored um, by Israel, by Israeli intellectuals, by the Israeli government, by the education system, this is totally correct. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have, wouldn't agree with the continuation of Omer's argument that this erasure from consciousness, from historiography, from uh, public discourse, 
per persisted down into the 1980s, 90s, and the 2000s. I think more and more that subject has um, arisen in Israeli discourse, is there on the table all the time, even if government spokesmen don't like it, uh, even if they pass a law against Nakba discussion or whatever it's called, um, it's there. Um, uh, and certainly it's there, and probably Amal will um, verify this, among Israel's Arabs who are, people forget, the Israeli Arab citizens are 21% of Israel's population. There's about 75% Jews, 21% are Israeli Arabs, Israel's population. It's worth incidentally um, noting that um, that percentage, 20%, of Israel's population in 1949 was Arab. 80% Jewish, 20% Arab. In 1949, at the end of the war in which many Arabs were um, driven out, many were expelled, 20% um, of Israel's population remained, of the newborn state of Israel, were Arabs who had remained inside Israel and became Israeli citizens. And that percentage persists to this day, despite the fact that 3 million Jews had immigrated to Israel from North Africa, from Europe, from other places. In the, the intervening years between 1949 and 2024, 3 million Jews immigrated to Israel. And nonetheless, the population, the Arab percentage of the population remains steady, which is due to high birth rates and other factors, but it's worth remembering. But, but that's, that's an aside. The main point I'm making is the erasure of the Nakba um, has certainly swiveled, if you like, and I think among Israeli Arabs, um, yearly commemorations, marches, visits to the remains of destroyed Arabs' uh, villages, this is um, a continuous and widespread. Um, um, so the Nakba is not forgo forgotten, rather the opposite among Israeli Arabs, and I think is um, still is very much a, a, um, there in the foreground of thinking uh, by at least thinking Israelis, but I think by most middle class and enlightened Jewish Israelis uh, to this day. I think this is important. Um, I, I won't take up more than 10 minutes, so I think I'll leave it at that. So I had, to, okay, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, we will uh, now move on to our third panelist, uh, Professor Amal Jamal. Professor Amal Jamal is the uh, Professor of Political Science at Tel Aviv University, where he is the head of the Walter Lebach Institute for the Study of Jewish Arab Coexistence. As a political scientist, his research interests include so state structure and civil society, political democratization and civil liberalization and minority nationalism. Some of his important publications include Arab Minority Nationalism in uh, Israel, The Politics of Indigeneity, and Re Reconstructing the Civic Palestinian Civil Activism in Israel. An honor to have you with us, Professor Jamal. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here with uh, uh, other colleagues, and I would like to thank Omer for proposing my name to be here on this panel. I'm I'm uh, uh, always fascinated by Omer's productivity, uh, which you know brings us to envy him as to his creative uh, ability to write very fascinating books and uh, come up with the uh, fascinating ideas. Um, as he, as you told uh, Sumoa. I'm not a historian, so I would like you to take note of that. So I'm, I'm not going to relate to, you know, history as much as to theory. And um, I, I would like to, uh, you know, um, present a few comments regarding the book that uh, uh, that you've read. And uh, um, um, it's deeply related, actually, although it was written before you know, October 7th, uh, it, it is deeply related to what's going on uh, since October 7th. And uh, um, I'm sure uh, whether we agree or not on, you know, uh, the history of the Holocaust, the history of the Nakba and so on and so on, definitely the uh, intriguing and tragic relationship between Jews and Palestinians is uh, manifesting itself in the worst way possible 
in the last three months. And I think it's really um, devastating to see what's going on, what had happened in on October 7th and uh, what is happening since then. Uh, and I think OMA's insights uh, could be very helpful in order to understand how one you know, should not only look at history, but also the history of the present. And uh, and this is one of the first ideas I would like to uh, uh, introduce. I think in my view, uh, the way I conceive the book, is it's a history of the present in the sense that it tries to um, um, you know, combine uh, personal history with uh, the broader concept of history. Um, uh, and uh, the prism or the, the disposition taken by Omer and his experience uh, and the fact that he tells us his history, uh, you know, how he developed into studying the Holocaust and the way he, you know, he grew up as an Israeli um, and the combination between these parts, uh, I think, uh, in my view, is very, very fascinating because it, it changes the way we look at history in general. And, and in this sense, he challenges uh, not, you know, history in the uh, factual sense as much as in the way we perceive history. And in this in this regard, he reminds me of uh, Walter Benjamin in his, in his piece on, on uh, history, that history is al always addressed from, from the now, from the current situation. And I think uh, uh, the fact that he, you know, produces this book even if, if he doesn't relate all the time to the current reality, I think it is there and it allows us to view history in a, in a very particular way. Um, and I'll come to that, a few uh, uh, you know, points on that uh, in, a, in a minute, but I would like also to, uh, since we are you know, uh, uh, talking to you guys in, in, in India also, I think, uh, what he immediately reminded me is the uh, of the subaltern studies, you know, Ranajit Goha and uh, Partha Chatterjee and uh, and other people. I, I you know, Tepash uh, 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 Shakarbati and uh, Spivak and so on and so on. I think these these guys have introduced a very interesting uh, and challenging understanding of history coming from below, and I think this history from below. Uh, tells us, uh, um, you know, a different, sometimes a diff completely different story than, than the elite history that has occupied most of historiography for, for, for the, uh, most, of, uh, most of the time. And I think this is very challenging. The shifting, you know, position um, is deeply related to, um, you know, the, the, uh, reframing the meaning of history in general. Uh, and how history is experienced, how history is written about, how history is is uh, um, is tackled uh, from below is very uh, um, telling, and uh, it it brings us to see you know processes that we uh, don't always see when when looking at a classical historiography, and I think this this contribution, although. Omer doesn't always tell us that, but it's there. It's very dominant, and I think very important to highlight it very much. And in this regard, also, I think uh, although Omer doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, relate to gender uh, history, I think it's it's very very influenced by feminist thought. And, uh, and uh, you know, at least it reminds me of standpoint theory, uh, and uh, you know, Sandra Harding and her view of uh, you know theory and 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 history and how people experience their reality you know speaking about uh, um, this uh, the point of view of uh, from the from the uh, from the point of view of the experience of average people and how they experience reality i think very is very telling um, so um, uh, this is one one large point the second point in this regard is actually, uh, in my view, uh, and in my own language, uh, Omer, you know, creates a very fascinating connection between post-colonial studies and the settler colonial studies. I think the fact, the fact that he relates to 
you know, European history, you know, German history, and then the Holocaust, and, and what happened in Eastern Europe in, a, in, a, in general and in a particular place. Um, I think from, 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 you know, his visits there, um, uh, it, it is somehow, um, you know, how actually the, the, the colonial past or how the occupation of the Germans of Eastern, you know, great parts of Eastern Europe, how they left tracks in the memory and the psychology of people. And uh, from this point of view, it's, it's very post-colonial in the sense that it, it looks at the experiences of people. So it's very phenomenological on the one hand, but it's also, you know, relates to uh, um, uh, the tracks of occupation. And that's why it's very interesting also to look at his views of, of what's going on in Israel-Palestine. I think uh, it, it's, uh, you know, um, although we, you know, some people would, would disagree uh, looking at uh, the current reality as post-colonial, but still, um, you know, the Israeli occupation and uh, and the Palestinian experience as a result, um, you know, gives us a very unique experience uh, or view at least of the experience of, of people here. Um, and uh, uh, how Israelis and Palestinians meet, meet each other, uh, I think, uh, and, and the shift he makes between being, being an Israeli and being actually detached from Israel in order to look at what's going on from a very remote place in order to be able to, um, you know, to, to reflect on, on what's going on uh, here, I think is, is very, uh, uh, very interesting. One of the things that come to mind uh, when he talks about, uh, uh, you know, the Holocaust, uh, and I'm not a historian of the Holocaust, I, I won't dare come close to that, of course. But still, theoretically, I think it it it, it made it, it it made me think about the um, at least two books that came out recently in the last decade about this topic. One is Ian Lustig's book on, on uh, Paradigm Shift and his chapter on what he calls Holocaustia and the instrumentalization of the Holocaust uh, in Israeli politics. Um, the way actually uh, the Holocaust became very holy in the Israeli uh, society and um, as a result of the impact the Holocaust on, on, uh, on Jewish history, Jewish memory, Jewish psychology, and its centrality, and as a result, its holiness on the one hand, but also its instrumentalization for political uh, purposes. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's very uh, interesting to look at his view on this regard, and I would have liked him to say more, you know, in, in, in the upcoming comments, I would like him to say more about uh, this instrumentalization, specifically now, uh, as a result of what has been, happened, you know, on October 7th, and the fact that many Israelis have used uh, the Holocaust language in order to depict or to uh, characterize what happened then. Uh, it's a new Holocaust, it's, a, you know, the Palestinians are Nazis, and so on and so on. But what does it mean, actually? What does it tell us uh, 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 about what's going on? And how it could be, actually, how could backlash on Israel and, and the Jews? How could it actually lead people to belittle the importance of the Holocaust as a result. If the Israelis and the Jews instrumentalize the, the Holocaust in this regard, uh, and the killing of uh, the genocide of 6 million Jews becomes a, 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 a political instrument, um, uh, what, what would it do in the future, given the fact that we are talking about actually you know, October 7th is, is, a, is, a, is horrific and, and the atrocities are horrific, but Israel is an occupier and the fact that, you know, the, and the powerful side and what happened since October 7th in Gaza is enough evidence to show that Israel ha has the upper hand. Uh, also, when we look at the West Bank and what's going on there. So what do you think, Omer, would happen you know, by this instrumentalization of the Holocaust uh, in, in such a way. Um, so this is um, another point. And uh, um, uh, the, the connection with, you know, with the Palestinians and the Nakba, 
uh, has come out in, in another book uh, worth mentioning, you know, by Amos Goldberg and Bashir Bashir, which raised many, uh, a lot of, uh, um, you know, critique here in Israel and uh, in, in, you know, in many other circles also, uh, despite the fact that they state clearly they are not comparing between the Nakba and the Holocaust as much as you do. And it's very cautious issue because there are differences between the two events. I mean, we cannot compare uh, between them, although they are connected. And I think what you argue is, uh, you know, uh, is reiterated by uh, uh, Goldberg and Bashir, and as well as the analytic, that we cannot ignore the fact that the Holocaust has led to the establishment of the state of Israel, which led to the is Palestinian Nakba. Now, we don't have to see them in a causal relationship, but <clears throat> they are affiliated to each other, and we cannot ignore uh, the need to actually tackle them uh, uh, in a way or another. And I think for the Palestinians, um, uh, the Holocaust was um, somehow very detached, very remote. Uh, um, many wouldn't have spoken about it in the past. I think we see more and more Palestinians actually uh, recognizing the moral obligation to deal with the Holocaust and and recognize what happened historically. And it doesn't have to have any ramifications on the right for their own statehood or uh, for independence or for uh, the right to resist Israeli occupation. Uh, so this, this is the conditional relationship between the Holocaust and Palestinian consciousness is very interesting. And if we had more, if we were, if we, uh, uh, where to have more time, I would have elaborated on this a, a bit more. But it's very interesting, something that you don't address, and maybe we should be, you know, we should be addressing, should be addressed. The, the shift in Palestinian consciousness regarding the Holocaust and the disconnection they are making between recognizing the Holocaust and its impact on Jewish psychology, on Jewish history, on Jewish rights, and so on and so on. But at the same time, it doesn't belittle their, you know, uh, uh, the impact of the Nakba on what's going on uh, until this very day. And my last comment would, would be is, is that the Holocaust is, is a historical event. It has its own tracks in the minds and experience of people until this very day. Um, the Nakba is still going on. And I think this is a difference. I think uh, I would have liked to, to make uh, uh, Omer in, in, in the parts in which you relate to. And I would like to ha hear you you know, saying a bit more about it, you know, what, what, because the, the Nakba is, is, is an ongoing process. It's still there. Palestinians have, don't have their own state. Uh, they have no um, uh, homeland in which they feel safe. And, uh, and um, you know, what's, ha what's, ha what's going on in the last few months is only an example of, of the fact that, um, um, that the Nakba is still going on. And uh, uh, how does it, how does it, uh, you know, resonate in the study of uh, not only the Palestinian history, Palestinian history, but also Jewish history? And uh, I, I would like to take you also to a, a place I don't know how comfortable you feel with, and that is, um, you know, morality and ethics. And I think this is very important: the relation between studying history and uh, you know, uh, ethical theory or, you know, morality and ethics of today, and the fact that uh, the Israelis have the upper hand in terms of power relations uh, doesn't mean that they are just or not. You know, uh, I think uh, what happened today in the uh, International uh, Court of Justice is, is uh, another reminder for the Palestinians that they are left alone, that no matter what happens to them, uh, and no matter how many Palestinians are dead uh, uh, and how many houses, how many houses are demolished uh, 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 in airstrikes and so on and so on, it's not enough from the back, from the, uh, you know, from the point of view of the Western mind uh, uh, and uh, the standpoint of the Western countries is only very telling about what's going on uh, today and the relationship between history and morality. So I would like to hear you saying a bit more about it, you know, given the time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Professor. And uh, so we would now, now go to Professor Bartov and uh, for his response. Professor, yes. Uh, thank you so much for these comments. And I would need uh, a couple of hours to respond to all these uh, fascinating, uh, really important comments. Um, I wish we had them, but I think I need to do it within, what, 10 minutes or so? Uh, so it'll be hard. Um, but I'm really grateful, first of all, for all these comments um, and insights. Uh, so I'll go in the order that the comments were made. Um, Jan Gross obviously hit the nail on the head. I mean, there, there, there is a lot in this book that, um, first of all, connects between a personal trajectory uh, that I had and in some ways that he had. Uh, I think there are um, very interesting parallels, the, despite the enormous um, age difference between us. Um, um, and, and I write about that in the penultimate chapter of the book, which I didn't uh, speak about earlier. I actually write about my own uh, personal trajectory, how I sort of moved from um, not just being a historian of the Wehrmacht, um, and, but also uh, into understanding at some point, uh, quite late when I was in my mid-30s, that I had in fact been preparing myself to write about the Holocaust without admitting it to myself, um, and that only the distance uh, from Israel after I came to Harvard in 89 on a wonderfully generous three-year fellowship that enabled me to sort of think what I was doing and where I was going, uh, only that distance from Israel actually made it possible for me to uh, start writing f at least increasingly engage with the Holocaust directly. And it's it's interesting, you know, um, um, often uh, when people present me or present my work, say, I wrote a book, uh, my first two books were about the, the involvement of the German army in the Holocaust. And I said, well, thank you very much. It's a very nice to say that, but that's actually not what these books are about. They're not yeah. about the engagement of the Wehrmacht in the Holocaust. They are about uh, crimes by the Wehrmacht. Most of them, because I wrote about the Eastern Front, most of them crimes against Soviet citizens. Some of them were Jews. Uh, the Wehrmacht did uh, play a role in the Holocaust, but that was not the focus. Maybe it should have been, as Jan was saying about his own work. Maybe it should have been, but he wasn't. Uh, I, 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 um, there was an issue that I was very interested in, and that had to do, and that connects to also what uh, Amal was saying. Uh, um, th there was an issue, which was that uh, German historiography and German public opinion refused to face up to the fact that the Wehrmacht had been involved in a criminal war. Uh, and I was among uh, the, the early historians who said, well, it was. Uh, and how do we prove that? We prove it by doing a history from below, not only seeing what the generals said, and certainly not just what they wrote in their memoirs, which were full of lies, but actually see what they did. And we can see that if we go to the archives and look at, our, at the documents uh, of uh, divisions brigades, battalions, companies, what were they actually doing, what sort of indoctrination they were getting, how they understood their enemy, and use as many as we can of their individual points of view, their letters, and so forth, whatever we have of them. Uh, so I was uh, um, not writing about the Holocaust at all, but I was interested in denial. Uh, and and that is something that I'm still interested in. And in fact, 
uh, the the book that I'm writing now uh, talks about two types of negations, as I call them, uh, on the Jewish-Israeli side and two types of negation on the Palestinian oh. side among uh, Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, 1948 Palestinians. On the Jewish side, the first negation is the negation that I was raised on, of course, which was a core negation in Zionism, which was negation of the diaspora. So we never looked back. We were supposed to look forward. The, the future belonged to us. Uh, the past was an obstacle that we had to overcome. Uh, and it took us uh, well into our 1940s to start thinking, where did we come from? Uh, not us, because we were mostly born already in the state of Israel, but where did our ancestors come from? Uh, and that, I think, was a generational thing of overcoming that negation in some ways. And the second negation was the negation of the Nakba that we grew up, as it, Benny said, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, we grew up surrounded by remnants of uh, Palestinian civilization. Uh, um, we we played cops and robbers in, in um, so-called abandoned uh, property. Uh, but we had no language to speak about it. Uh, we knew and we didn't know. Um, and, and as I write in the book, the first time that I started thinking about all this was when I went to Ukraine, was when I went to Eastern Galicia, and I wandered around uh, Jewish towns, uh, not only Buchach, but um, uh, many others there that had uh, cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries, in which uh, Ukrainian kids were uh, herding goats. Uh, and I thought to myself, what do they make of these tombstones there that are written in a language they can't read? I mean, what, what are they thinking? And I started remembering my own childhood growing up near near uh, Jamusin and near, near um, uh, what we call Chechmunis, uh, Shechmuanis, which is where the University of Tel Aviv is now, and seeing exactly uh, these sort of remnants, and including cemeteries, um, now they're gone mostly. Um, and, and so that sort of denial um, of what had happened or, or negation of it um, is still a work in progress, actually, among members of my generation. It's, it's, it's still not overcome. And on the Palestinian side, uh, there was, first of all, a negation of their identity, of who they were, because the, those 20% or so, 150,000 Palestinians, who did not leave, who remained, although many of them were internally displaced, so they remained, but they did not remain in their neighborhoods or villages, uh, were not even considered Arabs, let alone Palestinians. They were called minorities, uh, various minorities. Um, and it took a long time uh, for uh, Palestinians in Israel to start uh, thinking of themselves again as belonging to uh, a Palestinian nation to an Arab nation of, 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 and of being part of Israeli society. Uh, and the second negation was a negation of the, of the Nakba. Uh, it was very difficult, and I, I talked a great deal about that with, in, in my interviews, it was very difficult in many families to talk about what happened uh, inside the home uh, because it was a very traumatic event. Uh, which, of course, has echoes with growing up in families uh, without making a comparison, and yet uh, growing up in traumatized families. That is, people uh, on the Jewish side who grew up in families where uh, parents had been either Holocaust survivors or had managed to escape but had lost everything, uh, had lost their home, had lost their culture, had been entirely displaced. So the inability to speak about those events within the family, growing up with often with silence about what was constitutive in many ways to um, your, your own identity, um, was, was very much part of what happened in many Palestinian homes. Uh, and that too, as I think uh, Benny was saying, and it's 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 quite right, that is completely changed now. Uh, so the the Nakba now has become uh, an important element in how Palestinians think about themselves. And the Holocaust 
has become a very important element in how Jewish Israelis think about themselves, which it was not at the beginning at all. It took a long time, and it's only in the 1980s that this process that Amma was talking about, um, the instrumentalization uh, of the Holocaust picks up. Uh, one of the famous moments is, of course, when uh, Menachem Begin says that the Arafat is in Beirut like uh, Hitler in his bunker. This this sort of stuff, all the way to now, when on the Israeli media now, the usual way of talking about Hamas is Hamas slash Nazis. Uh, as if there's any connection between Hamas and the Nazis, there's no connection whatsoever. Uh, yes, the Hamas charter is, um, if you read it on its face value, it's genocidal. Uh, but it's not Nazi. Not 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 every uh, genocidal document is uh, Nazi. They have very different goals. Uh, so that's a sort of just a general uh, response. Now I I want to very quickly uh, respond to some specific um, uh, issues um, raised. Um, um, so what would uh, Jan was asking, uh, what would the world look like uh, uh, had the uh, Holocaust not happened? Um, look, um, first of all, uh, you actually can't write about Buchach, but you can't write about that civilization uh, without Agnon. Um, you can't write about it because uh, without Agnon, because Agnon in many ways created it in his literary work. So his own work on Buchach is, of course, not only on Buchach. It's a, he sees Buchach as a, as, a, as a microcosm of an entire civilization that was disappearing before the Holocaust. Uh, maybe his most famous book, uh, A Guest for the Night, uh, came out in 1939. And that book talks about uh, a visit to interwar Buchach, which he did visit in 1930. He visited it for a week. In the book, the guest stays for a year. He couldn't stay there for a year. It was way too long for him. Uh, but um, what he describes is a civilization that was basically dying uh, in many ways because of World War I and the devastation of World War I. Uh, but in many ways also because uh, it had encountered modernity and modernity was sweeping it away. So, you know, I'm I'm not very good in uh, counterfactuals uh, and the world would have looked uh, different uh, had uh, the Nazis not invaded that area and murdered all the Jews. But that particular kind of civilization that I write about in Tales from the Borderlands uh, would not have remained. It, it was already changing in many, many ways. Uh, also because people, including people from Buchach, um, uh, such as uh, Ringenblum, uh, were going to Warsaw, were becoming trained uh, um, um, as scholars, um we're leaving that world and entering a different a different universe and that's in many ways what uh the last parts of uh tales from the borderlands is about but i want to say one one other thing which is that you know i i went to poland uh in i think it was in the late uh, 1990s um to interview people uh, and I was just interested, really, in talking uh, with uh, Polish uh, intellectuals, scholars, um, who had some kind of Jewish background, uh, didn't really know much about it, and certainly didn't speak much about it. Uh, and I met them socially. That is, I had dinners with people. Uh, and this was one of the most um, important experiences for me in as I began to retrain myself in also in East European history, uh, that there was a whole layer that I think you are alluding to uh, of intellectuals, scholars in Poland who 
whose own um, life trajectory, I, I'm, I'm sort of careful about using this term identity, but how they saw themselves had to do with a great deal of, of a, a denial or or not coming to terms with, with who they were and where they came from, but at the time were in the process of beginning to encounter that, beginning to come to terms with that. Now, why that happened then, of course, there are many reasons, but obviously one of them is the end of the communist rule, and uh, but it's also age. Uh, and there, there was a parallel, I think, a complicated parallel between what was happening in Poland and what was happening in Israel for members of my generation. That is an opening up to parts of who you are or who, where you came from, what I call where you came from, um, which is not literally where you came from, of course, um, that happens at, the, at, at a certain moment in life and a certain socio-political moment, and that leads to a new understanding of your society, of your history. And in that sense, I'd say that what you were saying about writing a a, a first-person history is always writing uh, about... Uh, how individuals understand uh, themselves within history, but you are always there too. So th the first person history includes yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may, um, um, so it, it may not, I think, become a kind of all about myself. Uh, it may not become sort of nostalgic, but if it's done, and I was trying to do it. It's, it's, it's hard. If it's done at the right sort of um, tone, it brings in an understanding of a generation, of a culture, and of yourself as part of that process. Um, for me, that encounter at the time, uh, just like the the one you described with the with the Romanian reservists. Uh, there were moments of insight there that sort of jar you and move you to another place. Uh, and it has to do with the encounter between with, with a person and with a person's insight about themselves that enables you to rearrange your own understanding of what you're doing, what you're about, where you came from and where you're heading. Uh, this is the sort of more, I'd say, complex understanding that I have of uh, first person history and what I will be writing now is a personal political history of Israel and Palestine. Um, so I couldn't answer everything you said, but I was trying to touch on some points. Uh, quickly now, uh, some of the comments uh, made by Benny, I'm, I, I think that I very much insist, because I am a historian and I was trained in Britain and very empirically, uh, I insist that there is a complete difference between a comparison, and a comparison is always important in history, and a connection. I don't make any comparisons at all between the Holocaust and the Nakba. Uh, you could uh, if you wanted to, but I was not really interested in that. Uh, they are very, very different events. They are connected in some. They are they are comparable in some ways, but I'm I was not interested in that at all. I am interested in the connection between them, and I think Amal was uh, mentioning some of those. There are clear connections. Uh, there are personal connections that people move from one event to another. Uh, there are connections in that displaced people came to another place and engaged in displacing another population. There are connections in that both events, as I said earlier, are traumatic for the people who were subjected to them. And that trauma, certainly for a particular generation, has informed how they understand themselves. And whether that trauma is comparable or not is not really the point. It's like comparing suffering. Uh, suffering is suffering and trauma is trauma. It's, first of all, a very personal uh, event. And secondly, it can be also um, uh, created as a, as a, as a collective. Uh, event. I do, however, uh, from what I remember, 
uh, speak about one case uh, that I I was drawn to because of uh, Amos Goldberg, and then read the whole thing, and that's the uh, autobiography by um, by Benny Wirzberg, and and Wirzberg is exactly the example that uh, you uh, refer to of a Holocaust survivor, a young man who comes to uh, Palestine, is trained in the Palmach, becomes a sort of, uh, and talks all the time in his memoir, which was published, unfortunately for him, in 1967, just before the war uh, broke out and buried this book, um, following which he committed suicide, uh, talks about um, the, the joy of being able to handle arms now. In fact, German arms, which Israel was buying from Czechoslovakia, like Mauser uh, rifles. Uh, and then describes in some detail how he is killing Arabs in 1948, seeing them as Nazis. Uh, that kind of um, um, direct connection that he makes, and that I think was being made by various people, uh, often uh, survivors, but not only I mean, there were people like my dad who uh, was in the British Army and fought the Germans, and then uh, in '48 um, for the Arabs uh, in a war in which many of his and my mother's friends were killed. Uh, which, just to make another point, that although in 1948 was a very bitter war for uh, Israel and was perceived very much as a war of uh, survival. Uh, a war for existence, uh, the the number or, or, or the ratio of people actually went to fight in combat was quite small. Uh, there were, even in that society of 600,000 people, many who just stayed behind uh, and hoped not to be um, affected by it in one way or another. And that, and that was a big part of the discourse by the combatants uh, of that period. Um, the 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 second thing that you um raises my um um sort of as an example uh, um my exchange with rabin and rabin actually sent me back a letter from the ministry uh, not not a postcard but a letter from the ministry of defense uh, with the, the, you know the headline and everything um only it had just one sentence, how dare you compare? Um, and what I was writing, of course, was I was not comparing. And that's that, that's the sort of usual slippage. Uh, it's a little bit like, you know, when I published that letter in the, in the New York Times warning that there may be genocide, people wrote me, why are you saying that Israel is committing genocide? Uh, and so what I was writing in very small letters to uh, Rabin at the time was that um, I thought that the IDF was uh, in a process that would lead to its brutalization. I wasn't saying that the uh, Intifada number one uh, was the same as what the Wehrmacht was carrying out in Eastern Europe. I knew about the Wehrmacht and I knew what the IDF was doing. I was a soldier myself. Uh, but I warned about the process of brutalization of the IDF and I'm afraid in my books, uh, that process has proceeded. Rabin, however, despite his um, denial of, of the comparison that I did not make, um, saw something else. He actually, I think, not because of my letter, of course, uh, understood that that was not the way to go, that this conflict had to be resolved. Uh, and um, uh, the, the first intifada, uh, um, gave him some insight into the fact that this conflict could not be managed but has to be resolved. But he was assassinated due to incitement by people like Netanyahu, who then took over and then sold these goods of being able to manage the conflict until today. And on October 7th, we saw uh, what the result of that was. And the Unfortunately, the proof and the pudding of the brutalization, the ongoing brutalization that is the consequence of ongoing occupation is what we see in Gaza today. That um, 25,000 people have been killed, the majority of them civilians, the majority of those, uh, half of those civilians, children, about 10,000 children, 
have been killed. And in Israel, there is absolutely not an iota of empathy. The very mention of that uh, in many circles in Israel, certainly in the media, is seen as some kind of enemy propaganda. Um, and there is a constant recycling of the horrific events of October 7th. So that is the kind of comparison that is being made that justifies extraordinary brutality and callousness, uh, not only by the sort of radicals on the, the, the right-wing radicals around Netanyahu, but generally in Israeli society today, uh, callousness about uh, what the IDF is doing, and the IDF is made up of uh, many reservists as well who represent Israeli society, and the, the indifference to the causing, so still 25,000 people is not what the Wehrmacht carried out in the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, for the a Palestinian population in Gaza of 2 million, uh, we, are, we are talking about a vast percentage of people, an enormous destruction, um, unprecedented uh, destruction uh, in in urban warfare for decades. The the um, the third you you mentioned the erasure of the Nakba and uh, did it persist? And I think, as I was saying earlier, I think that um, the Interesting thing, and you you played a huge role in that, Benny. I mean, the most important role uh, of all scholars uh, in your book uh, on the the creation of the Palestinian question. Uh, no one has documented that uh, better than you. And after your work on this, no one could any more deny that uh, the vast uh, amount, the 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 vast proportion of Palestinians. Uh, uh, who were living in what became the state of Israel were either expelled or fled, often under intimidation. Uh, and the question is not whether it happened. After you wrote that, the question became, what do we make of it, right? Uh, nor did it happen, Be because before that, there was a lot of denial going on. Uh, but the way it's been interpreted, and and... I don't have to tell you that, is that on the one hand, as I said, for Palestinians, this this is a constitutive moment, and as Amma was saying, an ongoing thing. Of course, uh, the Nakba is ongoing. Uh, for Israelis, uh, for Jewish Israelis, the question is, um, well, okay, it happened, but was it a good thing or a bad thing? And I think that for the majority of Israelis today, if you actually ask them about it, they will say, well, if it's not a good thing, there's nothing we can do about it. It is what it is, uh, and we have to move on, which is what most of, you know, the Oslo Accords were, were based on that assumption. Let's not look uh, before 67, uh, which is an impossibility if you're a Palestinian. It's an impossibility to take that event out of the framework of speaking about any reconciliation. But I think that in Israel, uh, the the enormous contribution that you made in actually documenting it um, changed the way people thought about the event, not as did it happen or not, but was it a good thing? And ultimately, I think most Israelis, if you scratch the surface, will say, yes, it was most Jewish Israelis. Uh, and that is something that is a continuing denial of how the other side perceives it. And without accepting the view of the other side, you can never reach reconciliation. You can impose all kinds of things, but you can never... Uh, actually reach an understanding. Um, just as um, for Jews, you cannot begin a conversation uh, about Israel and the right of Israel to exist uh, if you deny the Holocaust. It's impossible. Um, quickly moving to to the last, um, to the comments by Amal. He, 
Amma, you, you raised so many things. Uh, so I'm going to um, be quick. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, you 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 mentioned Walter Benjamin. Thank you very much for putting me in in uh, in, in his shadow. Uh, also uh, Benedetto Croce. So I I've always thought that all history is contemporary history. We are always writing history from where we are, and when we are in a state of crisis, and when history itself is contested, it's not always as contested. But in the case that whether it is the Holocaust or uh, Israel Palestine. History is contested. We are always writing about it from uh, a, a a contested present presence uh, or present um, on history from below. I I already said I actually began my uh, dissertation was eine uh, Geschichte von unten was a history from below. That's that's what I did in my study of the Wehrmacht. It was then uh, very common. Uh, as a concept, but not in studying the Wehrmacht. It was more about social issues, and I applied that to studying uh, the German uh, armed forces, and there are huge benefits to doing that, uh, only it, it's very time-consuming. It takes a lot of energy to do it, uh, But and, and I apply that same concept later on uh, when I was writing about Buchac, but then I, instead of writing a history from below of three German combat divisions, I wrote a history from below of a town and of relations between people in that town. Uh, and that has many benefits, but it is time consuming and it, it is a kind of total history, but it's a total history of a tiny bit of history. Um, so yes, I, I, com I completely agree. I also agree with you, and I think I alluded to that. Um, I'm, I'm not a big in theory in post-colonial uh, theory, um, settler colonialism, uh, but I completely agree with you, uh, as I was sort of suggesting before, that the traces left by occupiers or by conquerors in the place in which they were uh, provide you with some understanding of uh, the world as it is now, uh, including uh, many of the denials uh, that it has based itself on. Uh, and as I said, this is something that I very much experienced when I was traveling, sort of my first very melancholy trip in uh, West Ukraine. Uh, and I began then thinking about those traces in the landscape in which I grew up. Um, um, as well as, of course, Thinking as Jan was suggesting, standing in in uh, in Potter's water and uh, thinking, "Wow, I, I I could have been raised here, uh, had history turned differently." Uh, so these kind of thoughts of the world could have been a different place, and the people who were ejected from it could have stayed there, uh, but then that would have rearranged everything. It wouldn't only be that I would be in uh, Potok's water, but that Shahmuanis would still be there, not the University of Tel Aviv. So everything would have looked very different, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, on, on the instrumentalization of the, of the Holocaust, is, you mentioned Lustig. Look, I mean, everybody's using these terms now. Uh, everyone. Uh, the, the, the Holocaust maybe has never been as instrumentalized as it is now. Anti-Semitism, the term, uh, ha has never been as instrumentalized as it is now. The term genocide has never been as instrumentalized as it is now. Everyone is hurling these terms at each other, not in order to provide any understanding of what's, of, of what's going on in most cases, but rather as a tool, as a political tool. Uh, so yes, I said that uh, there's a lot of talk about Hamas being Nazi, and I think that's nonsense. It doesn't mean that Hamas doesn't have a genocidal ideology. It's just uh, they're not Nazi. Uh, and it's the same as saying uh, that um, uh, criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Uh, it's the same as saying from day one, from October 7th already, there was an argument that uh, Israel was committing genocide in Gaza, it wasn't committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, it 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 only started bombing. It was getting closer and closer to committing war crimes, which I think by now 
uh, probably can be easily documented if anybody bothers to investigate that. And 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 we said the ICJ is debating this now, but the argument came before the action. Uh, and so everyone is using that terminology. And I personally obviously think that all of us, uh, we are scholars, we have written on these topics. It's incumbent upon us to intervene uh, in that discussion uh, in as reasonable uh, and authoritative a manner as we can not to let it go that way. So just as an example, uh, there has been, as we all know, there has been a real rise in anti-Semitism in Europe, in the United States, but there's also been a skewing of how you measure anti-Semitism to the extent that uh, pro-Palestinian demonstrations have been uh, defined as anti-Semitic. And pro-Palestinian dem demonstrations should not be defined as anti-Semitic, although there may be some people who are pro-Palestinian or also anti-Semitic. Um, I want to say on the, the last thing I'll say uh, on the uh, ongoing Nakba, uh, you know, yesterday I, I introduced a, my, my class for the semester, which is on the Holocaust and the Nakba. And I spoke uh, specifically about the fact that for many Palestinians, the Nakba is ongoing and the Holocaust is an event, uh, of course, is over. And there's a difference between the two. But I would say, and I spoke about that with my class, that is the case, but it's also the case that for many Israelis, uh, the Holocaust is not over. Uh, and it's not over in the sense of how they understand the reality. Uh, and if you look at Israeli society today, I think it has not been as uh, insecure, subjectively feeling as insecure as it feels now, probably since 1948. Uh, and I was in the war in 1973, and, I, and, and it was devastating, but I don't think it was uh, as bad as it is now. Uh, and that brings up immediately um, all the sort of internalized uh, uh, visions of uh, the Holocaust. Um, it, 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 it sort of makes it all resurface. Um, and, and so although the Holocaust is over and the Palestinians are still living under the consequences of the expulsion in, in what can certainly be called the ongoing Nakba, Unfortunately, on the Israeli Jewish side, the perception, not the reality, Israel is not facing another Holocaust, but the perception of it, not only from the top, not only because it's sort of being hammered and instrumentalized, but also because of what the population internalized, uh, partly from their homes and partly from the educational system, is playing a very important role in how people understand the world they live in. Uh, so in that sense, I'm afraid Yudha el in uh, 1987 wrote against the instrumentalization of the Holocaust during the first intifada. I'm afraid uh, that is still going on. It is a major actor in how people understand themselves, even though it does not help them understand the, the true reality. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll stop here with great comments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And we are uh, almost about time. So I just wanted to inform that we might have room for two questions. And I just wanted to ask if uh, the participants have any questions. Uh, then we will go. I just have one comment, if I may. Sure. Then uh, we do not have any questions. So maybe you can comment. And then I, I will ask one question and we will finish with that. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Omer is definitely right um, about Israeli attitudes which have hardened towards the Palestinians since October 7th. Uh, I think the Israelis uh, have lost sympathy, and many of them had sympathy, especially among those who were murdered by the Hamas along their border in the kibbutzim. Uh, they've lost sympathy for the Palestinians. Um, I think this is a repeat of, the, uh, well, the reason they lost sympathy after October 7th is because many uh, women were raped, men, men were raped, um, people were beheaded by the Hamas uh, killers, um, uh, 
people who are one year old or 70 or 90 year old were taken hostage and so on. Um, um, we're talking about a thousand people. Um, but they also lost sympathy in 1948 for the Palestinians. One of the reasons nobody recognized or wanted to see the Nakba for what had, ha what had happened, the catastrophe that had happened or befallen the Palestinians. And that is that the Palestinians who had been offered a two-state solution in 1937 and in 1947 had rejected it and launched the war against the Jewish community in Palestine. And then the Arab states joined them in this assault on the Jewish enterprise or the Zionist enterprise. So the Arabs did lose sympathy, but there's good reason in both cases for this lack of sympathy for the Arabs among the Jewish population in Palestine. It partly relates to the Holocaust. Um, Omer said that the Jews do not live under threat of Holocaust. I think that's a bit um, incorrect. The Jews in Israel feel that they do live under existential threat long term by the Palestinians and perhaps short term by the Iranians who are striving for nuclear weapons and God knows what they would do with them if they have them. So there is an existential threat in people's minds, which echoes what happened in Europe in the 1940s among many Israelis. Thank you, Professor. So, and I will just end with a quick, uh, very short question. I will keep it short. And I just wanted to ask you, Professor Bartok, uh, like uh, you, you mentioned about usage of terminologies and at the same time we could also what we see is anal analogies using of analogies and the comparison of israel palestine whether it's the uh, historical or the current war israel palestine with uh, warsaw ghetto even ukrainian jews and uh, even india pakistan which uh, regarding which i have sent you few readings as well like we had a world cup match and it was shown as a like uh, proxy warfare and sort of things. So as you have worked with, uh, you know, archives and first person memory more than me and, uh, uh, and I'm just a student. So I just wanted to know, like, uh, are there any documented evidence or political or historical memories? Have you came across to assert these analogies? Uh, thank you. So look, I mean, uh, historians uh, always uh, uh, make comparisons. You can't do history without that. And um, historians and many other people uh, who have any uh, historical knowledge always make analogies. And analogies can be very helpful in uh, understanding uh, whatever you're experiencing. Uh, but some analogies are better than others. Uh, and I, I've generally thought that making analogies with Nazism, uh, with Hitler, uh, with the final solution, uh, making analogies, not comparisons, comparisons can be made, but making analogies uh, is usually not a good idea. Uh, the main reason is that in making analogies with the Nazis and with the Nazi extermination policies, usually the Nazis win out. It's a very hard to find anybody uh, worse than them. And if the people that you are analogizing them are not as bad as they are, then maybe they're not so bad. And so I, I, I think it's not very useful uh, as, a, as a tool unless you are making these analogies with a political goal rather than a goal of actually understanding. You can, however, learn, and you must. After all, most of us here are historians, but I think Amal would also agree with me. You must uh, um, know the past if you want to understand the present. And so we can certainly uh, learn, say, from what occurred in Europe between World War I and World War II, and all kinds of social, political economic developments that we are seeing in the world today. Uh, and it, we won't understand the world today without, or we won't understand it well, without uh, uh, learning from previous events. But making direct analogies, I don't think it's useful. I think talking about um, Gaza, as which, by the way, uh, Masha Gessen didn't do, she didn't say it's like the Warsaw Ghetto. Somebody said it about what she said, but that's not 
actually what she said. Uh, but making, you know, talking about Gaza as the Warsaw Ghetto, I, I, I don't think that's a very useful uh, analogy at all. Uh, generally speaking about it as a ghetto, I don't think it's a, it's a very useful analogy at all. It is bad enough. And you don't need to talk about it in 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 those terms. It usually diverts the conversation in another direction, um, and, and 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 gets people into arguing um, about the 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 fine distinctions rather than about the actual horror that you're seeing right now. So yes, people do make it, and they have in the past. Just one example, you know. Uh, the the uh, Franz Werfel's uh, the forty days of Musadag uh, became a kind of little bestseller uh, among Jewish youths in the uh, in the ghettos uh, in World War Two before the mass killing uh, of Jews started uh, be, because people were making analogies uh, about um, the Armenian genocide that was used by Franz Werfel to write about Jewish faith before that faith became genocidal. Uh, and so that sort of connecting uh, between different events and trying to understand where you are on the basis of what happened in the past in reality or in fiction, uh, we all do that and it can be helpful. Uh, but as scholars, I think we, we want to uh, be as careful and judicious in in doing that as possible. Hope that answers you. Thank you. Yes, Professor, definitely. So with this, we have to end our session today. And it was a wonderful and excellent discussion and uh, meritorious questions from our panelists. And uh, apart from the book, we encountered many enthusiastic questions relating to the current war, which is very understandable at times. When we witness the return of history, we understand everyone's heightened interest as well as concerns. So we believe that through today's discussion with the, with the Gaza war surpassing 100 days and uh, the 79th Holocaust Remember Remembrance Day, which is just tomorrow, uh, our session could bring into light some important highlights and lessons from the past, which would be useful for many scholars. And to all our viewers and participants, I would like to request uh, that to read Professor Omar Bartov's Genocide, the Holocaust, and Israel-Palestine, if you haven't already, and this is the book, so please do read, and if you haven't already, before he comes up with another interesting book. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Professor Bartov, and Professor Gross, uh, Professor, Gross uh, Professor Morris, and Professor Jamal for joining us. I wish, you, wish everyone best with their upcoming projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.